Hey, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Angular Air. I am your host, Justin, and on today's episode, we are going to be talking about components, probably. <laughs> uh, our guest had a great title for it, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit about some Angular material stuff, probably some uh, stuff around that, so looking forward to it. Um, we're going to do a discussion show for this episode, so it will be a lot of talking and should be great. So say hi to our panelists, then we'll meet our guest, and then we'll dive right into the discussion. Joining us today, we've got Mike. Mike, how's it going? Not too bad. Hi. Probably. <laughs> nice. Nice. Alyssa, how's it going, Alyssa? So excited. Part two. Woo! Nice. Bonnie's with us. Bonnie, how's it going? It's going great. It's going great. I'm very excited about our guest tonight, who I'm not going to spoil. I mean, you're welcome to do that because he's up next. So, <laughs> hey, yeah. So, okay. So, I was telling him uh, we had Stephen Fluin uh, a couple months ago on the show, and he was just talking about you know all things Angular, and and uh, we had so many Angular material questions in the comment. It was like you know we so we we had to summon Jeremy, and uh, here he is. So, yeah. So, uh, How's it going, Jeremy? My turn now? Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Jeremy. Um, I, I suppose I'll introduce myself for the folks who don't know who I am. Um, I'm the tech lead uh, at Google on the Angular team for the Angular components team. Uh, we are the team that makes and maintains Angular Material, Angular CDK, and more recently, the uh, Angular Google Maps component and the Angular YouTube player component. So we're trying to branch out into uh, some new areas. Are you scored? Are you scored, Jeremy? Uh, scared of public speaking? No. No, no, no. <laughs> of all, <laughs> of all of the branching new, out. The branching. The branching. <laughs> no, it's actually, uh, the. this was something I've wanted to do with the project since its inception. And it was only more recently we were able to find some contributors inside of Google who were excited to use their 20% project to build some of these extra things into the components repo that we didn't have time for ourselves. That's so, awesome. <laughs> you named those two other components being Maps and... Uh, YouTube Player. YouTube, thank you. Um, as being separate, are they not necessarily a particular, particular part of Angular Material? Just that, separate Angular components? That's right. They are their own NPM packages. Uh, one is Angular Google Maps, one is Angular YouTube Player, and they are totally decoupled and independent from both Angular Material and Angular CDK, uh, largely just because they are providing an Angular API surface onto the underlying Google Maps API or the underlying YouTube iframe embed. So all of the actual behavior for these components is handled by the underlying Google API, and we're just giving you an Angular handle on it. Now, are those being provided through the at Angular scope on NPM or no? Yeah. Yep. OK, perfect. This way, if people are looking for them, it's easier to find. Like, maybe me. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I find really interesting is that Angular is a platform, right? As far as I know, unless it's changed recently, there's no components in it. So like Angular material is like the source that people can go to to see like examples of doing components, right? Um, mm -hmm. From Angular side of things, right? Yeah, um, that was, again, one of our goals at the start of the project was to have Angular material act as an example of what it looks like to build a UI component library with Angular and try as best as we can to follow best practices and set a good example for the community. Obviously, there's been some cases where uh, we were also figuring stuff out along the way and maybe would do things a little differently today. Uh, but I think for the most part, uh, we've been uh, successful in what we've tried to do. <laughs> I really like the way that the Angular material, uh, I mean, I, I like Angular material a lot and I think it's just, it's well organized. But one of the things that I always, and I don't know if it's meant to be like this, but I always go back and look because uh, it's really important when when you're doing tree shaking and lazy loading that everything is its own module 
And I've seen so many teams that accidentally put a whole bunch of uh, different routes all in one module, and then it gets clumped up and it's hard. And so sometimes because, you know, I get into architecture and, and team lead stuff, and then I, I get away from the code for a while, and I have to go back sometimes and remember the syntax and how to bring it all in. And Angular Material is such a good example for anyone who's kind of trying to figure out how to do all that. It's, it's just really... Uh, it's very simple. So I always go back there and see like how to load it all up and, and do it like Angular Material did. Because Angular Material is such a good example of like everything is, you, you can just use one component without grabbing the whole thing. And uh, and I like that it's, you could just go to the GitHub repo and look at it and it's very easy to see how it's done. Mm -hmm. And I also really love the CDK because so the CDK, which I think everybody knows, but just to recap for those who don't, it's just the Angular Material without, the, without any of the style and without any of the wrappers. And it's uh -huh. clean. Well, it, not a hundred percent that. Uh, it, so it is for some components. We do have uh, versions of the components without styles, but the CDK mm -hmm. uh, is more the building blocks upon which we made Angular Material. Uh, so the best example there is we have uh, overlay code in Angular CDK that deals with creating kind of pop-ups on screen, and so the Angular Material menu and select and autocomplete and dialogue and tooltip are all based on that. Um, and we are working, we are actually working on adding more kind of lower level components to the CDK right now. Um, we've got a couple of interns this summer uh, who are working on some stuff for the CDK, um, in particular a CDK menu, CDK list box and CDK combo box. Ooh, nice. This is, I love the CDK stuff because I like, like I remember a long, long time ago when I made an overlay for an app that I was working on back in, you know, like pre Angular JS and it took forever to like center it and get, and get all the layers and the, and the Z index. And uh, then when it comes out with CDK, it's just so easy to use. Same thing with the drag and drop. It's just so effortless it just it's just like the tiny i remember when uh, Alyssa, do you remember when you did the uh the demo for the drag and drop for us when it first came out yeah and it was just like what that's all the code we did it's like four <laughs> lines of code or something it's like so I easy i know i was so, amazed <laughs> we can't wait to see what you guys do next because it's just I, I it's just beautiful <laughs> um, i think yeah don't the, i think the refactoring from of pulling the cdk out and be separate from Angular Material is probably my favorite technical decision that the Angular team Can we talk created. about that and why it's your favorite and the point of it? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just say I agree with him. <laughs> I know that Jeremy and his team put a lot of effort into building Angular Material and thinking about uh, performance and accessibility and it, doing your best to adhere to the material design guidelines. Uh, but then to say, hey, look, we're done, would be great. And everybody would be incredibly thankful. But then you said, hey, what we did could be really helpful to other people. And also internally as well, I assume, to share some code across different components. Mm -hmm. But to be able to say, hey, we're also going to publish this so that other uh, component creators can utilize the same logic underneath the hood to build upon what we created and use the same foundation is just a tribute to the technical nature of the team as well as the um, the forward thinking of the community as well. And it's just, I, it's just a really good decision and a really good implementation. I liked all of it. Well, thank you. I like, I like <laughs> I it because you can actually crazy. go and read the source code. I, I went in with... It's going yeah. Did, did we lose your mic? No, I think I, I think, muted myself too early. I was like, after I'm done saying this, and then I just like, I think I muted myself mid-sentence. I went in with, what? I just assumed it was like back in the day when Bonnie used to mute Mike all the time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Mike started it, Alyssa. I said that, I wanted to say is that I went into it saying that it was going to be praise and just, hey, I stated it and it was. So thank you. If you're ever having a bad day, Jeremy, just come here. Uh, yeah, this is this is nice and positive. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. So maybe I, uh, what is the current like? Where are we at currently with what's available in Material and CDK and things like that? Uh, maybe we could talk about that first. Yeah, so uh, I'll talk about kind of the main project we're working on right now. Um, so the very big project we've had going on for the last, let's say, uh, 
about a year really now, um, is that there's this other project uh, from Google that's called MDC Web. And this is something that comes from the material design team um, versus what I'm on, which is the Angular team. So we're like two separate teams and two separate parts of Google. And um, in like the 2008 timeframe, uh, the material design team uh, started pushing out uh, these uh, this, this library called MDC Web, um, which I describe as primitives for building UI components. So you have some primitives in terms of uh, some CSS that's reusable. You have some behavior classes. Um, they use this kind of uh, they use this pattern that they call foundation adapter, which is where the foundation is kind of the primary core behavior for a component, and then the adapter is uh, in classical adapter pattern sense uh, something that adapts between uh, what they need to do and like the actual framework itself, and. What we've been doing over the last year is kind of reworking our components to be built on top of MDC web. Um, and this is kind of ongoing in our material experimental package. And we're doing this for a handful of reasons. So one is that rather than just kind of reinventing the wheel and coming up with the material design styles ourselves and having them also do the same thing, uh, we want to be able to just use the work that they've done as the canonical material design implementation so that we can stop <laughs> sitting down and spending you know hours on end getting like the pixels just right and getting the animations just right. So we get to defer that to them. And uh, that gives the Angular team more resources to work on kind of broader projects and different projects. And we also are hoping to continue working with this team more over time so we can collaborate on more shared component primitives uh, for things that will kind of end up uh, in a, like a CDK-like uh, kind of library that will uh, let people build their own UI components while reusing the primitives we come up with. Um, and Overall, it just it makes maintenance easier for us, and it makes uh, it makes the material design experience everybody is getting more consistent, um, especially inside of Google. Um, people are building web applications with you know a handful of different tools, and having them all be based on the same primitives helps keep those consistent everywhere. So, in terms of those primitives and the foundation and the CDK, is it something that is becoming difficult to? How do you keep material from influencing CDK, where if CDK you want it to be just the logic, uh, you know, right? right. Does that come up in play? Have you seen that, or is that not really an issue here? It, it does happen um, because a lot of what's in the CDK was built as a direct need for something in Angular Material, and so it does tend to reflect what we needed in building the component. Uh, but we do try as best we can to be mindful of how might other people use this. Um, and um, it is something where we, we do want to get contributions from other people who are using the CDK to add features that we may not need in Angular Material, but would be useful in other contexts. That sounds cool. Sounds cool. So that's that new part there for that. So that, that's new stuff with the CDK stuff, really? Um, as, as well, I guess, with the material as well, too, right? Both those will be using that then? Yeah, so right now we're focusing on just the Angular material part, and uh, we have some um, plans to collaborate more with the team that works on MDC Web on more CDK style work um, in the near future. Cool. Oh, and I, so uh, I'll also mention, uh, going back to the original question of like, what, what else do we have going on? Um, in Angular version 10, uh, we are going to be introducing a date range picker in Angular material. Uh, that is brand new, uh, uh, brand new enhancement to our existing date picker uh, that was built by Christian on our team. And he just did some really fantastic work there. 
Um, I love that guy. I remember <laughs> him from London, and he's so great. And I hope you'll tell him for us that we're very excited about the date range picker. Not oh. the date picker, y'all. The date range picker. Take my money. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Um, and um, as part of our work on those MDC components, uh, the, the new versions of those components, we're also adding a density system to the components. And so you'll be able to specify uh, like different density levels uh, for the different components, uh, because this is something that we hear from a lot of more enterprise flavored applications that they would very much want more dense interfaces. And so can uh, you define dense? Less white space. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That would be yeah. in the visual density settings within, say, Gmail or Google Calendar, correct? Yeah, something okay. akin to that. Okay. And, but and that still lines that. up with the material design. That's something that material design supports. So it's yeah, right. yeah. This is something that our team actually was involved in pushing for to land in the material design spec. Uh, something I had been advocating for for a while was a consistent density model for all of the components. Um, because if you go back to like the 2014 version of the material design spec, there were some components like list that had oh here's a list and then here's dense list and it's just kind of a one-off thing. And really the, you know, the, the engineering brain in me wants to be like, oh, we, we should have a consistent density system. Right. Yeah, basically applies. don't provide it for one component if they don't all have it kind of thing where it's, yeah. yeah. Um, and so now the material design spec uh, does have that density system. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it came out. It, it's uh, set up such that by default components are at density zero and you can go more dense uh, to like negative one, negative two, negative three, um, or you can go actually larger to like one, two, three, if you want to use the components in a in an extra large interface, like a television, or if you are say building a application targeted at children who would just like need bigger buttons and uh, you know nicer, bigger text. <laughs> no, is that something that we would be able to set at say the application level? Uh, yes. So the way our system will work is it's configurable per component as part of our theming system. So anywhere you would have been able to change the color of a component, you would also you'll also be able to change the density. So you can do it for you could do it uh, at a different density level per component, and you can also using SAS Mixin set it for different parts of the application based on CSS selectors and specificity. You don't have a you don't have a sneak peek you can show us, do you? If you don't, I, I don't tell anybody. I don't have anything running right now. If I had thought ahead, I could have made a demo. <laughs> um, I'm just curious um, if you, with that, I guess through CSS selectors, you'd be able to just essentially change a class based off of that. I'm wondering like uh, if uh, akin to, as I go back to like Gmail with that idea of the user being able to change the density, uh, but that would just be a matter of changing potentially CSS selectors um, to say, hey, we want a dense approach or a uh, less dense approach. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, a question from the chat um, asking about the shift to utilize MDC web is that, um, or what potential effects might that have with bundle size? Uh, this is actually something we're actively working on. Um, Paul uh, on our team is kind of doing a, a, an analysis of payload size comparison. And what we've seen so far in our measurements is that the JavaScript size of the components is pretty much the same between what we had before and with MDC web. Um, but we have seen that the CSS size for MDC web um, is a little bit larger in some cases. And we're actively investigating now the root cause of why it's larger and trying to figure out if we can do some refactorings to bring it down to roughly the same size. Awesome. Thank you for being mindful of that. I, I want to know, Jeremy, if you can pronounce Paul's last name, because I cannot. Oh, you're, I, I'll try. Put him on the spot. I'll try. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. You, you caught my hesitation. But I can't. <laughs> but I really like him, but I, I can't pronounce his name either, yep. so don't feel bad so, if you can't. I, I think like as close as I can get is Schwentner. Schwentner. That's um, pretty good. Uh. For, for anyone who doesn't uh, who doesn't know Paul on our team, he's uh, he's German, and so uh, he has a, a very German last name. 
pro tip if you're not sure how to say something, mute yourself while talking and then you totally cut yourself out. <laughs> Sorry, I think your internet's breaking up there a bit. Yeah, breaking up a bit. <laughs> Okay, so I, I did find a couple of questions uh, that we had originally summoned you for from the old one. Do you have time? Can we can we jump into a couple of those? Absolutely. Uh, so somebody had asked about the um, what suggestions do you have for somebody who's looking for a responsive layout? Like, what's the easiest way when you're working with like if you know you want to use Angular Material? Um, at one point there was a flex box. There's a grid. What about responsive? What about uh, native support? Can you give us? Any uh, guidelines for like, how do we handle if we want to do material layout? Right. Uh, so the first question that uh, I'll say, the answer is it depends on what you want to do, as it always does. Uh, there are no uh, one size fits all solutions. So the first thing I would look into is whether, uh, what, what is your browser support requirements, right? So that's going to affect which CSS technologies you can use. Uh, if you don't care about IE 11, then CSS Grid is a very attractive option these days for setting up layouts. Uh, it's very powerful. Um, if you are not using CSS Grid, uh, a Flexbox is obviously an option as well for setting up uh, a layout um, if you're going to do something yourself. Um, after that, there are a number of different layout systems out there that just exist in the world. There are people who are very passionate about layout um, and have put together, you know, grid systems and layout systems, um, masonry systems, right? All of these things are are things that the like the larger web ecosystem has created. Is and there like one that you use like in secret on little projects that you would be willing to share? <laughs> I, I honestly, on my personal projects, I tend to just do the CSS layouts by hand with either um, CSS Grid or CSS Flexbox. Oh, that's so um, refreshing, Jeremy. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, there's also, um, I'll mention, like, there is the Angular Flex layout library. Um, Adam Plummer is one of our um, Angular uh, contributors, and he, he works very hard on that project, um, and he's very passionate about it. Um, and it gives you a lot of, um, it does a, a lot of runtime handling of looking at what your uh, screen size is and uh, responding to changes in viewport size and uh, giving you kind of a, a handle on like uh, programmatically dealing with um, with layout with both, um, with both uh, Flexbox and I believe he has a grid system now uh, as part of that. That's good to know. I haven't seen that in a while. Um, I know that Flex Layout's been a been around for a while, mm -hmm. but uh, the documentation, because it can be a little bit confusing without the documentation. Do you know if Ad Adam's added documentation at all? Um, I think there is some. Um, I, I am not um, super deeply connected to the project um, right now. It is uh, largely Adam who's doing the, the ownership of that. And um, maybe we should summon him. <laughs> <laughs> Come and show us what you're working on. Uh, uh, yeah. Another question from the chat is somebody was looking for uh, the update, if there is any, on a potential date time picker, um, or if there's a separate time picker or a way to combine the two. Right. So this is one of our most requested issues, which we're very well aware of. Uh, some of the things that have been holding us back from working on it are one, just other priorities. Like I mentioned with the MDC web has kind of been a, a large priority that's taken up a lot of the team's time over the last year. Um, and then on top of that, uh, there hadn't been, um, there hasn't been a material design spec for a time picker. Um, and so we try to focus our efforts on new stuff. Um, either on uh, something in the CDK that is usable by everyone, or if it's going to be a material design component, something that is really well captured in the spec. And uh, Time Picker uh, was never really something that was, um, that had something in the spec we thought was something we wanted to build. Uh, there was a, you know, a point in time where it had a very mobile centric Time Picker design where it actually did pop up a clock, a round clock, and you would select times on a dial. Um, but because that interaction was so mobile centric, we didn't really want to invest the effort into building it since it, we, we do want to make sure anything we build is capturing um, both desktop and mobile use cases kind of with, with equal 
importance. Agreed. Um, and on top of that, like a time picker is just kind of difficult to build just because it has so many internationalization challenges as well. And so it's not a, um, it's, not, it's, a, it's a relatively large amount of work to invest in as well. What about in terms of uh, any type of animations and stuff? I know like with material design, there's these animations that are there. Is there that's something that becomes reusable maybe through the CDK or through the animations library? Um, any work around that? Yeah, this is something we've talked about many times over the years of giving people directives for things like, you know, slide and bounce, right? Because material design does this thing where you'll have some element that'll like slide into the view and like bounce a little when it lands. Um, and other, like there, there are other things in material design that are kind of these animation patterns, these motion patterns. Um, and it's one of those things where we always like, yeah, it would be really cool to do that, but we have all this other stuff we have to do first. And I think our pool of other stuff is large enough that it would be uh, quite a long time before we actually do get to having reusable animations like that. I have a question. So I love the idea of the YouTube and the maps components. And my company right now, we're working on the idea of building a DLS. And then I struggle with the idea of, all right, well, what are some components that are not really like a sign system component, but are like smarter components or do more, or maybe talk to backend APIs that it's not really design centric, but more application centric. So mm -hmm. I was curious if you had anything else in the pipeline that may be similar to the maps and uh, YouTube components that you were looking into? Uh, the only things really on my radar in terms of additional components in that vein, um, so uh, I'm not saying we are, we're planning on doing these, but these are ideas that I've had uh, just to set expectations. Um, so one would be uh, an Angular component around um, reCAPTCHA. Um, and another would be um, an Angular component around Google Payments. Um, uh, really, my thinking here is um, obviously Angular is a part of Google and we have the opportunity to provide some API services for other Google um, technologies to kind of make a more holistically like kind of nice ecosystem, if, uh, if that makes sense. And so that's kind of how I'm approaching this of, you know, um, Angular part of Google, Google Maps and YouTube are part of Google. And so how can we uh, invest some work to make all of this kind of a little bit more yeah. um, cohesive? Um, that said, um, I'm not sure if that's something that is going to, to make sense, like continuing to do that uh, for, for other technologies. We, it's something we'll evaluate on a case by case basis compared to, you know, other priorities, things like time picker and uh, like uh, two dimensional drag and drop has been a big one that people have been asking for. See, I, I really like uh, ideas like that. May I suggest you uh, take a pet and create a GitHub account and submit issues for those <laughs> requests that you could comment on with your account to <laughs> try and help build up the hype. This is like pro tips, you know? What? <laughs> So I have a couple of questions around um, uh, the reuse of the different components in Angular Material. Uh, first one would be if I'm going to want to say, take like the date picker and put it into an Angular element and ship it into my code base or whatnot, um, mm -hmm. is it pretty straightforward for me to be able to do that? Like uh, just kind of wrap it in the element logic and I'm good to go or are there dependencies issues I need to think about? So you're, you're asking about Angular elements specifically? Yeah, so I, like the, I want to say, hey, I want to use some Angular Material component that's out there right now, and I want to be able to ship that non-Angular to other apps in my ecosystem, right? Right, yeah. Um, I think it depends on, the, on a component-by-component -component basis how that will work. For some of the components, we pretty heavily rely on the components living in an Angular ecosystem. Uh, so content projection is the most obvious thing. 
where all of our components are using Angular's content projection, and um, there may be some issues uh, trying to hook that up to with with if you're using custom elements with Shadow DOM, uh, doing the slot based content projection. Um, so that would be uh, one area uh, where it could be a little bit tricky, and I think you have to do some kind of glue work to make those things connect to each other. I think you um, can do something like uh, bringing your slots into the your custom your Angular Elements template to to forward that through. Um, so I think today it does require some kind of like manual like glue work and connecting things to make it work together. Um, and this is something we get relatively infrequent requests for. Um, it's not that it's never come up, um, but the the louder voices in terms of what people are asking for are, tend to be more for uh, features and more components uh, rather than uh, element Angular elements specific things. Um, Although I will say, like on a related note, we have been um, uh, one of the project I had been working on over the past few months was looking into the way that custom elements work with Angular, um, kind of at an ecosystem level. Uh, and I actually had a lot of conversations with the the Polymer slash Lit Element team about that, um, and we came to some like interesting ideas and explorations about things we could do, and. Uh, that's something that may end up on our backlog at some point. Very cool. It kind of sounds like from that description that it's not much different from, say, if I have my own component already, right? And the things that I have to deal with in terms of making that into an element, um, not really anything barrier-wise from an uh, Angular material side, if I was to wrap it in my own component and then ship that, I can kind of solve those things. Yeah, exactly. And then in terms of... Um, you know, we talked earlier about Angular Material and having these ng modules for each component, right? And that encapsulation of that and the ability to just bring those in and import those in. Uh, with Angular 9 and Ivy and, and the ability to dynamically render components, uh, is there any approach that's being looked at for exposing those components directly that you could just then make the decision without an ng module to somehow use them? Or how does that come into play? Uh, we haven't done anything in that space yet. Um, we will be so i mean uh, when you when we talk about dynamic component loading i think there's there's two aspects of this there's one uh which is like i have some component that is already loaded and i just want to dynamically create an instance of it and then there's the dynamic like i need to like pull down the javascript and bring this thing up um for angular material we already do a lot of and, or, and angular cdk we do a lot of the former um using the existing like dynamic component creation apis and what's going to happen in a future version is removing uh the apis that we we depend on from the older version of angular view engine uh where it's it's depending on those apis and we can dramatically simplify them because of ivy um so kind of like the context for here, in case anybody doesn't know, is that in older versions of Angular, in versions 8 and before, uh, when you compiled an Angular component, you ended up with two files. You ended up with your actual JavaScript output from the TypeScript compiler, and you ended up with something called an ng factory. And that ng factory contained the generated code from your template and the DI that dictated how the uh, component should actually render and whatnot. And this made some things a little tricky because in order to dynamically load a dynamically render a component, you need to make sure you had that ng factory loaded in your application. And if you weren't rendering that component anywhere um, just in a template, the you know the optimization part of your build pipeline would see like oh you're not using this ng factory so i'm just not going to include it in your bundle and so you'd have to do a little bit of extra work that's why like entry components existed um and you'd have to have these apis that dealt with a like component factory right that was a, a representation of that ng factory file um with ivy all of the generated code goes into one single output file and so if you have a reference to the component, you can create it, and you don't need to like load a separate component factory. You don't need entry components, and so 
um, we will at some point be able to remove all of those old APIs we did and just have something much simpler. Uh, the reason they're still around now, though, is because we have um, we like backwards compatibility is extremely important to us, and so we want to make sure that for some number of versions that Angular Material and Angular CDK work for both Vue Engine and Ivy. We love you for that. <laughs> is there a... Not like it was a simple thing, backwards compatibility that you guys committed to. <laughs> is there like a goal of like 2022 or anything for being able to remove that? Uh, I don't have any answers on timeline at this point, but it's. I will say that um, moving on to where like the whole ecosystem is on Ivy is something we very much want to get to. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to throw out a comment uh, while we have a second that one thing that I recommend for people, if you are wondering about Angular Material or the CDK, you can actually go and maybe this seems simple uh, to some people, but you can actually go into GitHub and look at their code. And, and it's pretty nice. And I like it. I, I'm just like randomly while Jeremy was talking, I'm randomly just like diving into recent uh, stuff. Uh, there's a map marker. Uh, that Chris Beto was working on recently. And you can just go into the docs and there's a, uh, anything that you look at is uh, cdevelopers.google.com and it has like details about this and you can just go in there and see it. And it's it's actually, to me, there have been times when I'm, you know, when I'm learning stuff over the years with Angular that I get curious about stuff and I just kind of dive in and start reading the docs. I have seen libraries and things where you read the docs and it's really confusing. And that was not my experience with Angular Material. When I read the docs, if I, if I, I mean, there's still a lot of stuff in there, but if you actually get curious about something and start just looking at the code, it's actually pretty cool, I think. So I recommend that for anybody who's curious about it. Just go look at the GitHub repo. It's cool stuff. Yeah, if you wanna if you wanna go find an example of some code that I think is fun to read, we have a class called uh, Flexible Connected Position Strategy, which is the class <laughs> that uh, we primarily drives how we position overlays on the screen, and uh, that is one of probably the most complicated piece of code in the entire library. And I'm very happy with how it's commented and how it explains what it does. Say it again, Jeremy. It's flexible connected position strategy. One more time. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a mouthful. I'm just giving you a hard time. That's uh, a good it, one. It, we had an, an earlier version that was just called connected position strategy, and we then created a better version of it that was more flexible. And <laughs> <laughs> flexible connected. Okay. Say it one more time. Flexible connected position strategy. Position strategy. Yeah. I know he get thinks I'm right. trolling him now, but I'm really trying to get it. <laughs> Flexible connected position strategy. Oh All right. God, that's funny. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, we use the strategy pattern in a handful of places throughout the library to let people configure the behavior of something uh, with the idea being that um, most of the time, if you're not using a certain strategy, you shouldn't have to pay, pay the payload size for it. Mm. Uh, I love like that. Chat whether or not you are looking at possibly adding more schematics to material. Yeah, so um, I maintain a list of fun and interesting 20% projects for um, people who want to contribute to Angular Material. And one of the things that's high on that list is a more comprehensive, more robust set of schematics for scaffolding out application code with Angular Material. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest and say the ones we have today are pretty bare bones. Um, they were some of the first schematics that were created when schematics were first a thing <laughs> for, for ng generate. And um, I would like to have some prettier ones and some, some more um, feature rich schematics. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things where we, we would, we want to do it and it's on our backlog. Uh, but we have pool of pressing other work that takes up a, a lot of our attention. And so um, this is a good one that uh, is, is good for um, contributors because uh, it's very, you know, it's well scoped and kind of isolated away from the rest of the library code. It doesn't have the same constraints around it in terms of APIs changing over time. 
right? We can change the schematics from version to version and it's not a breaking change. Did you hear that y'all? They're looking for contributors to help with this. I, I will say that's not a, uh, that's not an invitation to just start sending massive PRs to the repo. <laughs> something that, uh, uh, any, any contribution, um, that's more than, you know, a, a bug fix. We, we always really just like to see kind of, uh, someone start an issue to start a discussion, uh, because, um, a lot of times, like, even if someone is very enthusiastic and wants to send PRs for a feature, um, we have a certain, uh, vision for the library that we want to make sure that we're sticking to and kind of reviewing code and making sure things are aligned with that vision, uh, does take a fair amount of work. And so um, as much as we, we love con contributions and love people to, to contribute, um, it does take resources to, to work with those contributors. And so it's something I just want to make sure people are, are mindful of so that uh, their, their expectations are in the right place. So if you have an idea for something that you think is a great idea, before you actually write the code to, to implement that, you want to open it up and say like, hey guys, what do you think about this idea? And kind of talk through it instead of just like opening a PR. Yeah. Hey, so I, I'm sure amongst other people as well, big fan of the CDK, absolutely love it. Uh, what, uh, what's upcoming and new? Anything that you can talk about that's, that's coming down the pipe for that? Yeah, uh, so like I mentioned earlier, we have uh, two interns on the Angular Components team this summer. Um, and so, their projects include a CDK menu, a CDK list box, and CDK combo box, and those can be used as the building blocks for for many other components. And I, those are things I've been wanting to add for a long time. And it's nice that we have um, some people able to like come on board and do uh, like a focused contribution on that. Um, longer term. Um, like kind of like I alluded to this earlier, but we're we're trying to figure out how we can um, take what we have in the CDK and kind of make it applicable to a, a broader pool of people and collaborate more with um, other teams inside of Google to to flesh it out more and um, really just do more with it. Um, Are we allowed to know your interns' names? Because someday we're going to look yeah. back at this episode when they're rock stars and be like, hey, remember when you were an intern and it's going to be great? Um, Can we have a shout out? So, yeah, my, my interns' names, are they're, they're Andy and Nils. <laughs> All right. Shout out to Andy and Nils. We're going we're gonna to play back this episode when they're, when they're like big famous uh, uh, rock stars. We'll be like, hey, you guys were interns once. Yeah, and they're great interns. They they're they're really on uh, on the ball. Yeah. Well, I've met a bunch of people uh, over the years at conferences that were on the material team, and I really think every single one of them was. I mean, there's just some awesome people, Christian and and Paul, and there's there's and even just just the way you know asking people questions on uh, on GitHub issues and stuff like that, asking asking questions at uh, conferences. They're just the nicest people, I think. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. You know, uh, do we have really... any more chat questions? Sorry, Justin. Oh, no, go ahead. go ahead. I was just looking to see if we had any more chat questions. Mike, were you watching the chat too? I was trying to. All right. Anybody in the chat? Because we're running out of time. So if you guys have any more questions for Jeremy, speak now or forever hold your peace. Because we're almost out of time. You know, we were mentioning earlier about, uh, and Bonnie, you are mentioning how it's such a great resource to be able to look at the material source code and to get examples to see. And, and Jeremy, you mentioned that it was kind of built initially for this concept of showing you how to do these things with Angular for building components and stuff like that. Um, and you briefly, through talking about a couple of these, these pieces of code throughout uh, this episode, you mentioned some design patterns as well. And so I think that's another awesome thing that we can get from looking at the material repo, right? Is not only how to do these angular patterns, but also how to see how some of these design patterns are, are implemented and how you guys are doing that. Yeah, uh, that's something I've always been uh, kind of a stickler for in terms of doing front end development is that um, I think there's this kind of, uh, this way of thinking that evolves in the front end community um, of, 
doing things the framework way, right? Uh, particularly with Angular, like people want to be like, I want to do things the Angular way, right? I want to create a text box the Angular way. I want to uh, validate a password the Angular way. Um, uh, I'm, I'm at a loss for examples. Um, I actually gave a talk about this like years ago in like 2014 at the first NG Europe. Um, and really the, my philosophy is like, you should approach front end engineering the same as you would like traditional software engineering. And it would be silly to ignore, you know, decades of, uh, people developing these like common patterns and having a language around these patterns. And so, um, I try to be very mindful of like what we're like, what we're doing in the context of like larger software engineering as a, as a field of. I don't know if I want to say study. It's a field of work. I think that's super valuable, you know, and especially when we dive in. I think it's like front end, you know, a lot of the stuff that is so easy to find yourself solving a problem or shipping a feature and it works. But maybe it didn't, the way you developed it or architected it, didn't set you up for long term success or other challenges you might face. And that's a big key in, in these design patterns, these things that have been established and we can look at and reference and go off of, is it solve some of those architecture plans to help you set yourself up for success? And if you can find ways to identify, how can I bring that thought process and that planning and structure as I do these shipping of these features that I'm building, um, you know, we, we can get a big benefit from that. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're getting close to the end. Any last questions coming through here that we saw? Uh, Emmanuel wants to know where they can make suggestions on components that they would like. Um, GitHub is the best place for feature requests. Uh, we try to generally triage things in a timely manner. Um, and uh, you can see whatever from whatever priority labels we put on the, the issue where that kind of falls in the like coarse grained bucket of our priority system. What about accessibility? I know that there's a lot of thought around and work around accessibility in material, is that correct? Yeah, that is one of the biggest areas of investment for us. So I, I mentioned my interns, uh, part of what I had them do when they first started their internship was, all right, here is all of the uh, developers.google.com accessibility page. Here's the uh, Rob Dodson A11Y casts. Here is uh, Hayden Pickering's book on inclusive components. Just go consume all of that. And that's kind of the fundamental thing we're going for here. Um, the reason we're adding like CDK uh, list box and uh, and combo box and menu are because the we want to capture the canonical behaviors for aria patterns and use those as the building blocks for components right um, I'm very I'm very enamored with this idea of um, the philosophy that all UI components um, and to a larger extent like UIs it's about deciding what the composition of aria patterns is that are coming into play. And so if you approach UI component building as an exercise in taking a bunch of off the shelf, like well-made um, ARIA patterns and composing them together, uh, you fundamentally end up with more accessible experiences. Um, I, I, I definitely wish I had kind of seen it this way uh, five years ago. <laughs> Uh, but as we as we move forward in the with the library, uh, this is kind of the approach we're more trying to take, and making sure that like accessibility is the like the number one priority in terms of like does this work right? Like something does not work unless it is accessible. It's hard because the Angular Material has things going on dynamically with the Shadow DOM, and there's stuff that's happening, uh, so it gets kind of crazy. Yeah. We actually, uh, we don't actually use Shadow DOM anywhere in uh, Angular Material. In fact, we turn off Angular's view encapsulation for uh, Angular Material for reasons that uh, probably don't have time to get into now. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll that make whole, it easier. Uh, is it that whole cascading part of CSS? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. 
it's a little crazy. I've gone back and forth on that because uh, I work for, I'm a developer advocate for Kendo UI and I love seeing projects that use both Kendo UI and Angular Material. And honestly, I loved your talk this year, Jeremy, way to go. But um, I just, I don't know, I... <laughs> It gets me. I don't know with view encapsulation what to do. People ask me and I'm, I've just, do you have advice for that? Because it, you're saying you're turning it off for material, but mm. personally, if you're not using material, do you just leave it on? Like, uh, how much time do you want me to spend talking about? <laughs> uh, actually, I just, I just need a lifeline, Jeremy. Something. <laughs> I I I think the the secret with view encapsulation is that the, my recommendation always is you have to know the difference because it's there's not really a one size fits all. Sometimes you want it on and sometimes you want it off. But you, but it, the trick is to know why and what it does. Yeah, that's exactly. same with lifecycle hooks. I think. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. Like there there is no one size fits all solution, and it depends on your use case. Uh, but also, there's a lot of ecosystem context. To, to take into account making that decision. I would absolutely love to have an Angular episode where we talk about CSS for Angular. I'm a big CSS fan. Oh, I'm yes. Looking at all that stuff, that'd be great. Especially should... Jeremy's CSS. It's just kind of fun. <laughs> I want to test really quick on the accessibility part. Is, oh. is that something that you see that could potentially be something that the material team provides as some core code that we could use throughout our app, not just something that we get with the material components, right? Uh, so that, that's part of the goal with the CDK. Um, so we do have a CDK slash A11Y sub package entry point um, that includes um, focus trapping and uh, uh, something we call ARIA describer, which is for managing your ARIA described by labels because they're tricky. And um, we have a focus monitor, which lets you figure out how something was focused. Um, one of the things we run into often is that people want to show focus indicators, which is the accessible thing to do, but they only want to show them uh, on keyboard interactions because a lot of users are weirded out if you show a strong focus indicator upon a pointer event, a mouse or a touch. And so um, that's something we use in our components to kind of accomplish that and as a kind of a compromise between um, what people expect and doing the right thing for accessibility. Um, I forget what else is in there off the top of my head, uh, but we do have those utilities. And then on top of that, we, we're doing things like um, the list box, comma box um, I mentioned earlier, we have um, a table and like stepper in the CDK, which are meant to be accessible building blocks upon which you can make more custom interactions. And so really a, a lot of what we are doing in CDK is uh, centered around accessibility as the starting point for these components. It's awesome. I love Very that. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're hitting the mark at the top of the hour. So um, let's wrap things up. Any last things anybody wants to mention or anything uh, in terms of material and all this There's stuff? one more. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of, of really good questions coming in, but I think like Ismail has a question, that, but I think it's just... It's like the beginning of the episode question and not the end of the episode question. Um, but Emmanuel was asking about um, uh, Angular Material sometimes requires ng zone, uh, and I think is there is that something that's going to be happening going forward that uh, Material will require ng zone? Will it go so, away? So that is gated on the Angular team, kind of as a whole, figuring out the long term plan for zones. Um, we definitely know we want to move into a future where zones are optional. And until we have a more concrete strategy at the ecosystem level, uh, we probably won't make any changes in the Angular components repos. It almost seems like it would be easy for zone JS to be optional. The hard part is getting all of the existing users on board with that and yeah. how that would change. Yeah. yeah. And so, so that's, that's really the, how do you do that? How do you do that, Jeremy? <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what the we tricky part. Yeah, that's what we need to figure out. And uh, we also need to figure out kind of what comes in in the place of zone. Um, because part of, you know, like going back all the way to the Angular JS days, part of the magic of Angular was that you- Two-way data binding. You, you just, your, it just happens. <laughs> you have your state and your template just magically reflects that. Um, but that magic comes at a cost. And today that cost is zone JS. 
um, which has its trade-offs. And so we need to explore alternate sets of trade-offs. Yep. I like so. want and that. Get everybody, I want uh, that t-shirt. I, I was it comes at a cost and then just have zones like on the back. <laughs> I wanted to weigh in on that, that uh, people are very eager to um, squeeze every amount of performance out of their applications, get rid of zones, what about modules, can we get rid of that, and what have you. But at the same time, people need to remember that Angular is very performant as is, uh, that for a lot of the applications to get created, especially like CRUD-based applications, you don't have to chase that type of performance to get a very, very usable application. And sometimes the simplest way is the best way. Just to provide a little balance on that conversation. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good thoughts. And on that right. note. Well, let's uh, let's get some picks, see if anybody has any picks, and then we'll, we'll call it a show. First, our panelists. Anybody have any picks? Did you expend your picks on our previous episode? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite gonna... is just the Kendo UI date time picker because we have a kick butt material theme. It integrates perfectly with your already you know, Angular material application, and uh, we love accessibility. So check it out. <laughs> that was a legit plug right there. I like that. I like that. Who wants to follow I'm, that? I'm rarely, I'm rarely like the cheesy plug girl. So I'm sorry, Jeremy, that it was on your episode. It was just so relevant. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I have two very quick picks. Uh, one, I want to, I want to end with the pick that I started the last episode with, which was the uh, Equal Justice Initiative. There's some uh, crazy stuff going on in the United States. And there's this guy, Brian Stevenson, out of Alabama who has been working for um, uh, a lot of uh, criminal justice reform for a long time and trying to get some equality. Um, and then the second pick that I have is Jeremy's uh, interns. And Jeremy, I think when your interns finish what they're working on, they should come on Angular Air and show it to us because not everybody who's doing this stuff always has to be this be so big cool. expert, right? And, and is I think it would be really a cool. nickname or a first name? Because that's awesome. That's a first name. <laughs> I love Will you... Will you tell them that we we humbly request their presence when they get what they're working on working? I, because it's not just you. They don't have to just even come and show us the new component, but also they could actually show us like how they wrote it and some stuff that they learned along the way. And because it's a teaching show as well. I mean, you know, we, we want to hear updates of what you guys are working on, but we also really love it when people come on and teach us stuff. So just, you know, just a thought that um, they could be invited. All right. We'll we'll discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about you, Mike? Uh, just uh, in light of your pick um, with everything going on, just the words of Ellen DeGeneres, actually, of just be kind to one another. Um, how she closes out her shows just has been ringing truer and truer to me uh, every day. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right, Jeremy, do you have any picks? Anything uh, you want oh. to plug? I have nothing but picks. Um, <laughs> so I uh, maybe similar to what Bonnie mentioned is like in this time, like may, maybe my topic would be protesting. Um, if you um, if you are able to then uh, and able to do safely, like uh, joining a protest is something that I, I think is great and is a great way to uh, <laughs> to be an ally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I Sorry. think it's a time. This is the time to do that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, definitely. Like I, I think um, that's that's really important to do right now. I'm I'm not really great at talking about this, uh, but uh, do it right. Like charities and protests and expressions of support. Um, every every little bit is. Uh, is a step in the right direction. <laughs> um, and then uh, moving past that, uh, some other, some picks that I have just based on things that are on my desk. Um, I've been reading this book lately. It's called Just Enough Research. Oh my gosh. Uh, it is by um, Erica Hall. And I'm finding this book um, so useful. Um, it's really uh, an insightful look at like how to 
really it's like based on the title, just, just do enough research to where your decisions are actually based on evidence instead of whims. Um, <laughs> some, definitely some pitfalls to avoid. Um, and another thing I will recommend is I got Mike the, did not like that book. No. <laughs> that's, uh, that's one of the book of heart books. Yeah. Yes, it is. That's awesome. I love those. <laughs> Another recommendation I have is, uh, like many people, I'm just basically stuck here sitting at my desk for many hours a day and not really uh, going a lot of places or going to gyms anymore. Uh, and so I got these resistance bands uh, that I've just kind of been fiddling with at my desk. And so uh, I spend a lot of time in meetings every day just kind of taking these resistance bands and stretching and kind of doing range of motion exercises while I'm sitting here, uh, which at least gives me the illusion of being active. I really want those. Your book reminded me, because I know I already did my picks, but your book reminded me of my book, uh, Principles by Ray Dalio, That's I'm reading. It's um, highly recommended. Very nice, very nice. And wow. now I want one of those band thingies. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. That that's the point of the pick, right? The I know, I know. That's a good pick. Excitement and influence, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to add one more thing too. That uh, Jeremy, in your background, you've got your poster. We see the word "vote." I think that's oh, the other one that's really yeah, important. Yeah, I can I can raise this up, and that is my uh, Obama campaign poster uh, that I find myself looking to often. <laughs> It's very good. I think that's something that's super important for all of us to contribute to and, and help out is I mean, get out there and, and do that part because that's going to be a big key thing that we can have an impact with, right? For sure. I miss that guy, man. Yeah. We didn't even know what we had. <laughs> all right. On that note. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thanks, Jeremy, again, for coming back. We always love having you on the show. Um, several times you've been on, so this is always great. Uh, I always look forward to the next time, too. But we really appreciate you sharing your time and uh, talking about this content. Thank you. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Yay. Awesome. Come back soon. Have a good one, everyone. Take care. Next time. See ya. Bye.